Hi, I'm Chappington, and welcome to Skraeliga. As you know, the Vikings have a long history of raiding foreign lands and settling them. And in this chapter, we're going to focus on their movement westward. In the 9th century, the Vikings settled the Faroe Islands and Iceland. Though for Iceland, there is some evidence that there are these hermetic monks known as Papa. Or Papa, I'm not sure how you say it, um, that settled like a century beforehand, but it's inconclusive. Colonization of North America, which we include Greenland in North America, uh, began with Eric the Red, who was exiled from Iceland in 982, and he spent his three-year exile exploring up and down the coast of Greenland. When his exile expired, because that's a thing in Iceland in the 10th century, he gathered a group of colonists, about 25 ships, and made the journey to Greenland. Only 14 arrived. That set the foundation for a settlement that, at its height, would reach about 5,000 people. Um, unfortunately, Eric the Red would kind of be the victim of his own success, because in the year 1002, a group of immigrants came in and brought along an epidemic that killed him. But when Greenland was settled, of those 14 ships, one of them had been blown off course and saw some land further west. So Eric's son Leif took this information and eventually further, ventured further west in one, the year 1001. And he first landed in Heluland, which is assumed to be Baffin Island. And then he ventured further south to Markland, Labrador, and eventually, Leif and his crew continued south and landed at Vinland, which is present-day Newfoundland. And they stayed for the winter at what they'd call Leifsudir. They met some natives there that they'd called the Skralingi, which distinguished them from the Inuit who were living further north. And the relations were okay initially until Leif's brother Thorvald got into a fight with them and was killed by an arrow in 1003. So Leif Sudir had been established as a ship repair and navigation outpost, but because of that conflict, they temporarily abandoned it. And then in, in the year 1009, Orfin the Valiant led a voyage back to Leif Sudir with around 250 people. And then after the winter, a hundred of them stayed to inhabit and defend the area. And then Thorfinn ventured further south, the remaining 150. They landed at Stramfjord, uh, present-day Mira Bay off of Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia. Um, again, relations were all right. There was some trade, um, but it was tense enough that when one of his bulls escaped, it spooked the natives and they charged. And most of the men there ran away. At that point, though, Eric the Red's daughter, Freydis Eric's daughter, she didn't run away because she was eight months pregnant. But basically, she just whipped out a boob, hit her sword against it, and let out a war cry, which was enough to scare the rest of the natives off. So after that, the natives in Norse mainly kept their distance. There was some occasional trade, but yeah. By the 1040s, the population of Stramfjord had grown to about 300 people, thanks to more immigration coming from the east. The climate was better than Leifsfordia, which was a lot nicer than Greenland, but the winters were still pretty cold. And the recent winters had been getting colder, and so there was a bit of pressure to settle further south. So in 1041, Freydis' son Mikael Freydison, uh, the one that she was pregnant with in that 1010 skirmish with the natives, gathered a small crew to explore further down the coast. And after finding a good spot, present-day Lobster Bay, Nova Scotia, the southwest tip, he gathered 120 men, women, and children ready to set sail in the early spring of 1042. The voyage, of course, ran into a cliché in that it encountered a strong, out-of-season nor'easter, and while everyone survived, it pushed the fleet too far southwest and out to sea. After this happened, Mikhail made the decision to turn north and find the closest land and then take stock of the situation. 
And then soon they sold the land, the archipelago that they would name Screenland Yaw. A small fleet made landfall at what would later be called Smarvik, a small bay on the southern side of the island of Storain. The settlers gathered together to figure out their next steps. Should they return to Straumfjord, or should they take a look and consider settling this new land? After some discussion, there were three small exploration parties that were formed to gather intel. So one would go up north along the coast, one south along the coast, and Mikjal would lead a party of five northwest over the mountain, Mount Thor, to get a better vantage point. But it was already the afternoon, so they all set up camp and they'd start exploring at dawn. Unbeknownst to the settlers, a small Abenaki hunting party was on the mountain, and they noticed the strange ships landing on the coast. They reported back to their village and sent out a party the next morning to meet the strangers, and they eventually met in an opening in the woods to the west of Mount Thor. At this point, the Norse were already had some experience meeting native Skraelings, and after some careful, slow attempts at communication, the, the natives seemed all right with it. So the expedition parties returned later that day, and they all made the trek over the mountain uh, to the Sigwan River, and they found a fertile valley downstream from the Abenaki, and that's when they got to work chopping down a bunch of trees, building houses, planting seeds, and they established the town of Skraelingborg. So the settlers traded some of their tools for corn, which is an unfamiliar crop that the natives said would grow well. So they were growing old world and new world plants, as well as they had brought some sheep and some cattle along too. And by combining the two, it led to a more stable system of agriculture than was practiced further east. And the theory is that this is why Skraeliga survived the present day, whereas the other colonies didn't. Throughout the rest of the 1040s, the settlement developed further, but didn't expand too much more. The corn grew really well, so with the regular harvest, winter wasn't as much of a problem, as much as, say, certain European colonists would run into five centuries later. Uh, so work began on replacing the small wooden church with a larger stone one, which still stands to this day, and the thatched earth vast houses were starting to be reinforced with wood, and there was a few more structures built to better accommodate the settlers so they weren't so cramped. Unlike with the previous Norse colonies, there were no hostilities for at least the first couple of years, but this changed in the summer of 1045. It was a bit of a fishing dispute where some of the Norse fishermen had gone upstream, past one of the Abenaki villages, and it turned into an argument that turned into a fight and resulted in several deaths, including all the fishermen and some of the natives. The Abenaki tribe gathered their warriors and hid in the woods surrounding Scrailing Bork, setting up an ambush. But the intent was not to ambush everyone, because they sent a small diplomatic party, and they entered the city and demanded an audience with Mikhail Freydeson. He and some of the other heads of household met with the Abenaki, who kind of revealed some of their warriors to show, hey, we've we've got the village surrounded, and they're caught completely off guard. So they, they presented them with the choice of either staying downstream and keeping out of their fishing area or getting the whole village destroyed. So that was a pretty obvious choice. So the Abenaki left after sending their very clear message, and in the aftermath, the heads of households that were assembled kind of decided that they needed to make some sort of formal authority, formal government, to better organize the settlement, called the Thing. And that's the ancient predecessor to Skraelinger's current parliament. Uh, so there were three things to discuss. The first one, whether to leave for some other faraway land to get away from the natives. They discussed it, but voted against it unanimously. The second was if they should prepare some sort of counterattack for revenge, and the third being, how how did they prepare for an attack like this in the future? Yeah, based on how badly they were caught out, they were not prepared to fight. And so the effort went into building fortifications all around the town. They set up patrols to keep guard. And so this yeah, turned Skrælingborg into a pretty well-fortified town. After fortifying the settlement, life in Skrælingborg was pretty stable. 
which made it attractive for more immigration from further east. There was a large group of around 60 people in 1053, and then a similarly sized group uh, came in 1057, but this included another common guest from medieval ships, and that was disease. The exact disease that it was isn't really known at this point, but it was a deadly enough to kill about 10 to 25 percent of the Skraelingans, that's the people of Skraelingborg. Because of the contact with the natives, somewhere between 20 to 50 percent of them died. So while the Norse settlement was badly damaged by this, the native society was just devastated. This was on a scale they had never witnessed before. It destroyed their society. This ended up contributing to them doubting their own religion and way of life. And while the Norse hadn't really been doing much missionary work, unlike a lot of other Christian colonists, because the Norse had only recently converted to Christianity themselves, they were welcoming of the natives integrating into their society. And so while the Abenaki culture still survived, it would never recover to the earlier peak. Because of this pre-Columbian exchange, Skraeliga was now firmly in the hands of the settlers of Skraelingborg. Outside of Skraeliga, the Norse continued to expand. Einovik was established down the coast from Lisbeda in 1051, but was abandoned later that year after fights with the natives. Humorfic was founded in 1064, where Mikjall had originally intended to land. The island of Anticostinar was occupied between 1062 and 1068, but a series of poor harvest forced the settlers to leave, and there were temporary settlements in Heluland and Markland, but they were generally not inhabited through the winter. In total, that meant one new settlement was built, and the settlements that weren't abandoned continued to grow. So that's the story of the settlement of Skraeliga. Thanks so much for watching. Feel free to discuss in the comments, and I'll see you next time.